Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm David Wu. Welcome to The Money Game, where we make actionable predictions about the big story shaping the world today. If you're interested in making money, you're in the right place. If you're not, this program is designed for anyone who's just interested in knowing what makes our world tick. Please sign up at davidwombound.com if you haven't done so already. I'm going to talk about inflation again today. Not because there's nothing else to talk about, but only because this is really the only game in town. Now, one of the questions that's been bothering me is this. Many of the sources of the global inflation shock are systemic in nature to the extent that they ought to affect everybody the same way. So why is it that some countries seem to be faring worse than others? And what does that mean for financial markets? But let's start by reminding ourselves, why is it that we're spending so much time talking about inflation? First of all, inflation erodes your actual purchasing power. We've got here a chart for Australia. In blue, we've got the growth rate of hourly pay, which is growing currently around 2%. And then in orange, we've got, you know, the consumer price inflation, which is growing at 3%. In other words, inflation is now growing faster than the actual income growth for an average Australian household. In other words, that the standard of living in Australia for the average household is going down. We've seen something like this in the past, as you can see on the chart, but nothing quite as extreme as has been the case for the last few months. By the way, I'm not picking on Australia only because everybody else is pretty much in the same boat. Secondly, inflation has a tendency to exacerbate income inequality. Take a look at this chart for the United Kingdom. What it shows you is that the low income households tend to experience high inflation than higher income households. Moreover, not to mention the fact that higher income households, because they've got stocks, they've got real estate, which provides some hedge against inflation, they're also more insulated against inflation shocks. Inflation also breeds discontent. We've got here a chart for the United States. In orange is the famous misery index, which is a simple sum of the unemployment rate and the consumer price inflation. What's interesting, of course, is that notwithstanding the drop in unemployment rate this year, the misery index currently is actually higher than it was at the start of the year, mainly on, the, on account of the fact that inflation has been on a tier. Okay. In blue here, we've got a number of people who said that the country is going the wrong direction, which has also been going up since May in tandem with rising inflation. This is consistent with the fact that, of course, you know, Biden's approval rating is in free fall. Actually, last week, the latest USA Today uh, poll showed that his approval rating has now dropped to just 38%. Wow. Historians like to remind us that hyperinflation brought the Nazis to power. But we don't even have to go back that far because only 10 years ago, inflation brought on the Arab Spring that toppled governments from Egypt to Syria. Finally, inflation is often a precursor to recession. We've got here a chart for the United States. In blue, we've got inflation that's captured by the so-called core personal consumption expenditure deflator, which is the Federal Reserve's favorite measure for inflation. And in, in orange, we've got recessionary periods. What this chart shows you is that, you know, a pickup in inflation has tended to precede, you know, the start of a recession. Not all the time, but often enough for us to think that this time we could see the same. Most people think they know what is driving inflation, but do they? I think this is where a cross-country perspective could be helpful. No question a major driver of inflation has been a spike in commodity prices. This is a chart of raw industrial commodity prices, and you can see they've gone up more than 50% over the last 18 months. The price shock that has gotten the most attention because it's relatively easy to understand is associated with, of course, the supply chain bottlenecks. A great example of this is, of course, what's happening on the high sea. This is a chart of the container freight rates. So you can see container freight rates having double in 2000, have double again in 2001. Common sense tells us that global supply chain bottlenecks, rising commodity prices, affect everyone. 
Indeed, when we're looking at the manufacturing producer price index, they're more or less rising at the same rate, whether there is the Eurozone, the UK, China, Korea, or Australia for that matter, more or less around 10%. If producer price inflation seems so similar across countries, why is it then that consumer price inflation seems so different across the same countries? This chart plots the consumer price inflation for 12 of the largest economies in the world, four in the Americas, four in Asia, and four in Europe. And what really stands out here is the dispersion of inflation across these countries. Why is it that Brazil inflation is running over 10%, but in China it's less than 2%? Why is it the US inflation is running at over 6%, whereas in Japan there is no inflation at all? What's more, this dispersion cannot be attributed to how much different countries spend on energy and food. On this chart, we are looking at core inflation, which excludes you know, food and energy, and yet you can see the same dispersion remains. You know, Brazil, core inflation is running at 7% versus China, less than 2%. The US is growing at 4.5% versus Japan, and almost minus 1%. A popular way of measuring the underlying inflation is by stripping out the outliers, by throwing out components with particularly high readings and basically components with very low readings. And then when we look at this measure, the so-called trimming inflation, you can see you know, the same dispersion remains. The US, you're still looking at about 4%, which is more than, which is about double that of the Eurozone in Australia. Another way of comparing inflation across countries is by comparing, okay, just how extreme are the current readings relative to their history. You know, for that we calculate the so-called Z-score. This chart, I basically rank the core inflation of our 12 countries according to their Z-score. And what it shows you, of course, is that the U.S. immediately jumps to first place. A four standard deviation, the current reading of core inflation in the U.S. is an absolute extreme event. At the other end of the you know, spectrum, you've got China and Japan, but most countries are in the middle of the pact. You know, UK, Korea, Australia, Switzerland, more or less a one standard deviation event. Important, but nothing to write home about. This brings us to the million dollar question. Why are some countries experiencing higher inflation than others? In my view, the dispersion of core consumer price inflation has a lot to do with the relative aggressiveness that different countries have pursued monetary policy, especially with respect to money supply. What I've done here on this chart is I've plotted okay, the changes in money supply, M2, across my 12 basic economies. And what it shows you is that one, at one extreme, you've got Brazil in the U.S. where money supplies has gone up by almost 40% over the last two years. At the other extreme, on the other hand, you've got Switzerland and Mexico and Japan where money supply has increased by not nearly as much as in the U.S. and Brazil. Many economists, including some famous ones, like to tell us that quantitative easing is not inflationary. But I suspect there could be wrong. Just look at this chart here. I plotted core consumer price inflation against changes in money supply for the 12 countries in my sample. And you can see a very positive relationship emerges. On one hand, you've got the likes of Brazil and the US where money supply has grown rapidly. And guess what? They're seeing above average inflation relative to the sample. On the other extreme, you've got you know, the likes of Switzerland, Japan, in the euro area where money supply hasn't gone up quite as much. And guess what? They're seeing below you know, average inflation relative to the same sample. The consensus among economists that quantitative easing is not inflationary is very much informed by the experience between 2009 and 2014 during the so-called QE1, QE2, and QE3, when after basically very aggressive bond purchases by the Fed, very little inflation came out of it. However, I would argue, okay, then and now are very, very different, as you can see on this chart here of M2 growth, money supply growth. 
Back then, you know, money supply never grew more than 10 percent, whereas this time, money supply has been growing at a rate that we haven't seen in 30, 40 years. The difference, of course, has to do with the fact that back then, okay, U.S. banks were basically under pressure to unwind their balance sheet. In fact, we saw a tightening of lending conditions, and all of that meant that basically much of the inflationary impulse associated with money printing was offset by the deflationary, basically, effect of the deleveraging in the system. This time, however, we're not seeing any deleveraging in the private sector while the Fed is ramping up its bond purchases. This is the reason why I think this time inflation is much more likely than was the case in the past. The second reason why I think U.S. is seeing stronger inflationary pressure than elsewhere is because of a bigger drop in labor participation rate in the U.S. versus other countries. As you can see here, U.S. labor participation rate is about two percentage points below where it was before the pandemic, whereas countries like Canada is now basically, you know, labor participation rate has returned to the pre-pandemic level. And in the case of New Zealand, it's gone out even higher than the pre-pandemic levels. Why is the labor participation rate in the U.S. so slow to recover? Why aren't all these millions of Americans who left the labor force during the pandemic been so reluctant to return? I think the answer is actually rather straightforward, except nobody wants to talk about it because it's too political. I think it has to do with the vaccination rate. The reality is that even though Americans were among the first to get vaccinated, still today, fewer Americans have been vaccinated compared with other countries. And I think this has a lot to do with the anti-vaxxers. And as I basically mentioned in the past, the anti-vaxxers are a product of the politicization of the vaccine by the Democratic Party ahead of the 2020 elections. And we continue to pay the price until this very day. I certainly don't think it's a coincidence that immediately after Biden announced his vaccine mandate, get vaccinated or lose your job, that we saw immediately a big jump in terms of number of Americans who quit their job. Indeed, that was the number that really caught my attention last week, that the quit rate in September jumped to 3%. At 3%, as you can see, is at all time high. In other words, it can no longer be explained by cyclical factor. There is no doubt that poor policies under this administration are only helping to exacerbate the inflationary pressure in the system. Indeed, Biden is his worst enemy. I disagree with the consensus in the market that inflation is transitory. Okay. In my view, the inflationary consequence associated with the massive monetary expansion in the U.S. over the last two years has yet to be felt in full. Also, I think that the anti-vaxxers in terms of their impact on the state of the U.S. labor market is going to be here to stay. In other words, I think inflation might turn out to be more durable than is generally expected. I think there's another risk associated with the inflation is transitory thesis that I want to talk about now. In line with my predictions in September, COVID's fifth wave is unfolding and unfolding with a vengeance. Over the last month, every week, the number of new confirmed cases globally has been going up. The situation in Europe is so bad that Germany this week reported record number of new cases in countries like Netherlands, Belgium and Ireland are recording numbers in per capita terms that are approaching the dangerous level that we saw in Israel this past summer. More pertinent for the global inflation story is the fact that China, which has been at the center of the global supply chain bottlenecks, has not managed to crack Delta. Given China's zero tolerance policy towards COVID, Beijing right now has the most stringent policies in place to prevent the spreading of COVID compared with any other G20 economies at the moment. You might say, well, when would China start to ease its zero tolerance policy? I suspect it won't happen until Beijing has developed a new, more effective vaccine, which could still be many months from now.
If I turn out to be right about inflation, I think it's safe to assume that central banks will have very little choice but to act. Bond investors are starting to get the joke. Last week, the short end of the global bond market had another heart attack. In fact, on the back of the 6.2% inflation reading out of the U.S., we saw surging basically bond yields, especially in the front end of the yield curve. Two-year bond yields in the U.S. went up 14 basis point, in U.K. 16 basis point, Australia, you know, 12 basis points. These are huge moves by any stretch of the imagination. Against this backdrop, interest rate volatility spiked last week. We're not yet at taper tantrum levels, but we hit a new year high last week. Not surprisingly, the focus in the market remains very much on the U.S. on what the Federal Reserve is going to do about rising inflationary pressure. As a result, the market has priced in now more than two Fed hikes okay, in the second half of 2022. The dollar is surging against currencies of countries that are expected to lag in this interest rate cycle, such as the euro area. I think now that the euro has broken down below 116, I think clearly, technically, it looks like we could actually see 110 before everything is done. Across markets, investors are now paying more and more attention to the outlook for U.S. monetary policy. As I've been telling you for the last couple of weeks, the best barometer of U.S. monetary policies is probably 10-year U.S. real yield, the yield on 10-year U.S. inflation treasury securities. And you can see here that the correlation, you know, between risky assets specialty, but not only risky assets, but also things like gold and Bitcoin and 10-year U.S. real yield are now firmly in the negative correlation. In other words, the market understands when U.S. monetary policy tightens, real yields go up, risky assets and Bitcoin and gold are going to go down. Okay. In fact, I would argue that the fact that as late as the first week of October, S&P 500 sported a positive correlation with 10 years U.S. real yield, and now it's turned negative. That is the sure sign that the market is transitioning from trading growth to trading monetary policy. The way the U.S. stock market traded last week is consistent with a market that is starting to contemplate the possibility of inflation being more persistent than otherwise. Indeed, you can see last week, consumer discretionary got absolutely destroyed because investors are worried about the ability of these companies to pass on higher costs onto their consumers. Whereas material, which is generally seen as a good hedge against inflation, did extremely well. Okay. Even the likes of utilities got crushed, not to mention, you know, essentially the uh, staples. Okay. The only sector other than material that did well was healthcare, where I guess inflation is going to be relatively, you know, essentially the uh, immune. My call for higher long-term real yields so far has not played well. In fact, last week, 10-year U.S. real yields fell again to now minus 1.2% near the record low. In case you're wondering, I'm not even thinking about throwing in the towel, not by a long shot. My call for higher real yields is basically predicated on my view that monetary policy works through long-term real interest rates. In other words, without real yields going higher, there is no chance the Fed is going to be able to actually stabilize inflation. At the same time, I think that real yields are factoring in too high a probability for Lyle Brainard, the super dove, as becoming the next chair of the Federal Reserve. I think Biden will have very little choice but to go with Powell if he wants basically his nomination to get through the Senate smoothly. And I think Powell ultimately will prove to be less dovish than he's been talking of late. Before we wrap up today, let's take a quick look at my honest board. My long Pfizer position, you know, did very well last week. I took profit at 50, which was my target level. It's been an amazing trade and certainly is now giving me enough ammunition to basically hold on to my losing trade, such as the long 10-year U.S. real yield and the long 
VIX trade, which is slightly down on the week. Okay. Meanwhile, my short euro and long dollar trade is doing extremely well. And my long, you know, Exxon Mobil trade is still flat after the uh, slight basically uh, loss this week. In any event, more to come next week and talk to you next week.